together, please. The book of First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. You know, in light of our Savior's first coming, which we're preparing to celebrate in just a few short days, we're, our hearts and our minds uh, turn and, and look heavenward in great anticipation of his coming again. Aren't you thankful that Christ is coming again? And of course, First Thessalonians is driving home the fact of Christ's soon coming. The Lord had done a tremendous work in the life of these Thessalonian believers, and truly they're exemplary in their Christian lives. They're not perfect, like, like you and I are not perfect. However, we were thankful as, as God inspires his word uh, through the Apostle Paul to, to address an issue of the Lord's second coming. We're thankful that the Lord has not come back uh, and that uh, we've not missed it, just like the church in Thessalonica had not missed his, his return. But as we continue here in chapter number two tonight, uh, there's, a, there's one verse that stands out this evening. If you're able, I invite you to stand with me. We'll read just one verse this evening. Verse number 13. It's a powerful verse. And uh, the Bible says in verse 13, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Father, we're thankful for the word of God tonight. Lord, we see some some major claims here uh, concerning your word in this short verse of scripture. And Lord, tonight our prayer is that you would give us your help as we look here in, in, these, uh, in these passages of scripture that our hearts and minds would be encouraged, that our faith would become more settled and, and sure, uh, founded firmly upon the word of God. Lord, we're thankful for the testimony of these saints of old. And Lord, our prayer tonight is that uh, you would bless your word. May it accomplish its work in each of our lives. Lord, we know that your word will not return void, just as you've promised. And so, Lord, we do pray that you'd speak to our hearts, teach us great and mighty things, help us, Father, become more like Christ. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bibles, I'd like to draw your attention to what the Word of God says right in the heart of verse number 13 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul, again, he recounts how they had, notice, he says, Ye received the Word of God. Ye received the Word of God. Aren't you thankful tonight that you've received the Word of God? I want you to look with me back in, in Acts chapter number 17. In Acts chapter 17, we remember the, the circumstances surrounding the birth of the church in Thessalonica. Again, we, we find, just as you turn, just want to call your remembrance the fact that while Paul is reinforcing the truth of Christ's second coming, the rapture, the catching away of his bride. We find it to be true, it's settled, it's sure. We find a great emphasis on the gospel, and at the same time, we find a great emphasis on the word of God itself. The word of God is vital for our faith, isn't it? It's crucial for our faith. The apostle writes in Romans chapter 10, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. When they, were arrived, when they had arrived in Thessalonica, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse number 2. It says, And Paul, after his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And the Bible says, And some of them believed, and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. 
I praise the Lord for those who believe. Don't you? And it was to these who believe that Paul is referring. It's to these who believe that Paul is writing. And the Bible says, look back in, in verse number 13, at the end of the verse, he says, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now, do you believe tonight? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Do you believe that he is, the, in fact, the way, the truth, and the life? That no man cometh unto the Father but by him? Do you believe that, that he's coming back? I, we, we believe the word of God, do we not? And as Paul writes here, he's, he's reestablishing the truth of God's word. You know, if we're not careful, we allow life, we allow winds of false doctrine to affect the way we believe, which affects the way we behave and live. The, the church in Thessalonica had been told by the Apostle Paul these truths surrounding Christ, that he is, in fact, the Son of God. Paul's message never changed. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Remember the Philippian jailer asked? To which Paul and Silas responded, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Neither is there salvation in the other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Paul's message never changed. Salvation by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. And we, we understand these truths. These are foundational, fundamental truths of Christianity. But if we're not careful, we listen to the noise, which brings doubt, which brings worry, which brings fear. The Lord has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And as Paul writes the church in Thessalonica, he's reminding them of the veracity of God's word. Do you believe that God's word is true? Do you believe that God's word is inspired? Church, tonight we live in an age where, where things are changing rapidly. Our society, our culture is moving so far away from God that if we're not settled with the source of our faith, then our faith will waver. These Thessalonian believers, their, their faith, while they believed, their faith was wavering. And in this one verse, Paul reminds them, he draws their attention all the way back. He brings them to the point of their salvation. Look what he says again in verse 13. He says, ye receive the word of God. Ye receive the word of God. They believed the Lord Jesus Christ. They were saved. And now he's reaffirming to them, teaching them again. They, they say repetition is the key to learning of the faithfulness of God's word. And tonight, very simply, I'd like to share with you three, three truths, fundamental truths concerning God's word. Because as we look back at our lives, we've received the word of God. But I pray that I never stop receiving the word of God. That I continue learning from the Bible. That I continue adding to my faith. Learning, growing, becoming more like my Savior. Notice three simple truths tonight. The first is this. You and I, we must receive God's word as God's word. That's kind of simple, isn't it? But it's true. We must receive it as God's word. Look back in verse 13. He says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, 
Because when he received the word of God, which he heard of us, he received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. What is, what is this? This is more than a book. Kids, I want you to look up here tonight. This is more than just a book. These are not Uncle Remus fairy tales. Okay? This is not some speculation of man. This is, these are not just cute stories. This is, this book, do you boys and girls, do you have, do you have Bibles tonight? If you have one, hold it up high for me. You guys have one? Yeah, hold it up. What is this? What is this? This is God's word. What is it? It's God's word. That's amazing. Thank you for playing along. You put your Bibles down. But it's God's word. Church, you and I must never forget that this is God's word. I want you to, to look at just a few passages of scripture tonight. It's the truth of, of inspiration and preservation of scripture is not simply a New Testament truth. It's a biblical principle. Look what the Bible says all the way back in the book of Psalms. In Psalm number 68, in verse number 11, you see, it's God's word. So where did God's word come from? It came from God. Look what the Bible says in verse number 11 of Psalm 68. The Bible says, the Lord gave the word. Who gave the word? So another, another name for the Bible is the word of God. This is the word. It's the word of truth. It's the word of God. It's God's word. It's the Bible. And the Bible says in verse 11, the Lord gave the word. Who gave us the Bible? God gave it to us. We look again, even in Habakkuk. Would you look there, please? In Habakkuk chapter number 2, Habakkuk is a is a, an extraordinary book. It uh, deals with a great many things. But how many of you guys realize that, that the book of Habakkuk also deals with biblical inspiration? Look what the Bible says in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse number 1. He says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what uh, he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And of course, Habakkuk, he's, he's prophesying on the eve of the destruction of, of Judah and Jerusalem. He's speaking of, of Nebuchadnezzar, who is going to swiftly come through the land and annihilate everybody. He's going to besiege Jerusalem and haul away the remnant into captivity. He's going to destroy the temple of God. And Nehemiah says he's perched there upon his watch. I stand upon my watch. He's a preacher of God's word. But notice what God says to him in verse 2. The Bible says, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. What did God instruct Habakkuk to do? To write the vision. He wrote it down. I want you to look at what the Word of God says in the New Testament. With this very truth in mind, turn with me, if you would, please, to the book of, of uh, 2 Peter. 2 Peter, chapter number 1. Peter was a phenomenal man. He was a man of great privilege. Peter is the only person other than Christ to have ever walked on water. Liquid water. Right? There we go. Let's phrase it that way. I've walked on ice. I've fallen on ice. But Peter walked on the Sea of Galilee in the midst of a storm, did he not? Peter was, was part of, of a group of Jesus' disciples that, that we would refer to as his inner circle. Peter and and James and John, these men were brought into close quarters with Christ during some of his most personal and profound teaching. 
And they were there, they were witnesses of so many things. On one occasion, the Lord Jesus Christ took Peter and James and John up to the Mount of Transfiguration, where, where the deity of Christ, uh, the deity of God shined through. They saw Jesus as he is, as the one true and living God. And Peter, man, he, he spoke out, didn't he? He said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. And uh, he saw it with his own eyes. He saw some very extraordinary, miraculous things with his own eyes. But you know what Peter says about the Bible? Look what he says in verse number 19. He says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Friends, tonight you and I, we can trust God's word more than we can trust what we have seen. Amen. Amen. Have your eyes ever played tricks on you? Have you? How many of you ever go deer hunting? I remember the other, it's been a while, but I remember I was sitting in my tree stand and I looked over and I thought, man, that looks an awful lot like a deer. And I sat there and I studied what I was looking at and I quickly realized it was a log. <laughs> my eyes are playing tricks on me. I thought I had seen something that I had not seen. Friends, you and I, we don't have to trust our eyes because we can trust the word of God. It is a more sure word of prophecy. The, the Word of God will never play tricks on you. It will never lead you to believe something that is incorrect. The Bible is true. The Bible goes on to say in verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Notice in verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. As Paul speaks to the church in Thessalonica, he's reminding them that God's word is God's word. We think of Habakkuk, look, thinking back to Habakkuk where we just read. He said in verse 2, And the Lord answered and said unto me, Write the vision. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God moved these men to write them. When I was a child, we used to go to a family camp at, up at a place called Camp Patmos, it's on Kelly's Island up in, uh, in Lake Erie. And I remember on one occasion, we decided that we were going to go sailboating. Has anybody ever gone sailboating? Uh, you know, I'm a chicken. I was, I was small, and Lake Erie was big. And, and I remember getting out on this, on this itty-bitty two-person sailboat. It was just my dad and me. And... You know, we get out there and he hoists the sail and off we go. But we were being propelled by the wind. These holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Think of a sailboat. It's got that big sail, but, but it's not the sail that moves the, the boat. It's the wind that moves the boat. It filled that sail and it propelled it along. Just like the, the writers of God's word they were moved by, by the Holy Spirit of God to write God's Word. I want you to look back, if, if you would please, in the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. The Bible says in that from a child thou, sh thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then he continues. He says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Christian, tonight, as we consider the Word of God, I'm thankful that we've received it but I want to continue receiving it. And I want to receive it as God's word. 
It's not man-made. It came not in old time by the will of man. Man is not the source. God is the source. Notice the second lesson that we learned back in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 13. I pray that God would help us receive it not only as his, as his word, but as the truth. Receive it as the truth. Again, in verse number 13, he says, When ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Note that word truth. The truth is, it is God's word. And by very nature, as be, uh, because it is God's word, it is truth. If it was not God's word, it would not be absolute truth. We live in a world of relativism, don't we? You know, what's true for me may not be true for you. Uh, there are people looking for answers today. There are questions being raised by society today that many of us really, in our heart of hearts, don't necessarily know how to respond to. But the Word of God is the answer, because the Word of God is truth. And we consider that the Word of God is the answer to all of our questions. It's the solution to all of our problems. Why? Because it is truth. You know, there are, there are laws of nature, aren't there? The law, aren't you thankful for the laws of gravity tonight? Sometimes I wish the laws of gravity would lighten up, if you know what I mean. Um, but I'm thankful that, that, there is, that there are laws of science. There are laws in nature. God created a perfect world that has been marred by sin. But we see laws of nature, the laws of thermodynamics are inarguable. They're based in truth. Two plus two will never be three. It will always be four. Two odds will always make an even. Three plus three is six. Nine plus nine is 18. There is truth today. But more than truth just in mathematics and in science, there is divine truth. In Romans chapter number 1, we, turn there with me if you would please, in Romans chapter 1, we live in a world that is endeavoring to discredit and deny the word of God. Uh, but it doesn't mean that God's word is not true. The Bible says also in the book of Romans, let God be true and every man a liar. But in Romans chapter number one, we're dealing with depraved, depraved man. And the Bible says in Romans chapter number one, in verse, uh, in verse, oh, let's see here, verse number, verse number 22. Notice what he says. is professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. <laughs> I was watching a video today. A government official was, uh, I, would, I don't know if interviewing uh, would be the, the, the correct, they're questioning some presidents of major universities like Penn and um, Harvard about the anti-Semitism that is erupting on their campuses. And they say, is, is anti-Semitism uh, and the call for the genocide of Jews, not just in Israel, but but globally, is, does that go against your standard code of ethics at your universities? And it's surprising how they would not answer the questions. It's astonishing. It cost the president of, of Penn her job. It's only wrong when it produces an action. So it's not racism to call for the global extinction of, of the Jews, genocide of the Jews, only when that turns to action, only when you do it, that's when it's wrong. And that, isn't that foolish? That's the world we live in. And you have these people sitting uh, with, such, with such pompousness, uh, smugness, and they're professing themselves to be wise. But you know, they're nothing more than fools. And you and I would be the same if it were not for the grace of God. And the Bible goes on to say this 
in verse 23, it says, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Notice verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. And worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. Who's the creator? Jesus Christ is the creator. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. You see... You and I are to worship Christ, not the creature. We're to worship our creator and our redeemer, not his creation. Unfortunately, however, our world and our society is is working to warp these things and discourage people and to dissuade people away from the truth of God's word. But truth is absolute If it is not absolute, it is not truth. I want you to look with me, if you would please, in Psalm number 119. In Psalm 119, notice the claim concerning God's word in verse 160. Psalm 119, verse 160. The Bible says in verse 160 of Psalm 119, 50, or I'm sorry, 119, I'm all, I'm all discombobulated here. Psalm 119, verse 160. It makes sense? I don't know. We'll see. 119, 160. Thy word is true from the very beginning. Well, what's the beginning? Well, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Thy word is true from the very beginning. And every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Do you know what that means? God's word is true and it will never be wrong. God's word is true and it will never be wrong. And we look here tonight and we must receive the word of God as it is in truth. Look back in verse number one, uh, in chapter 119, verse number 89. The Bible says this in verse 89 of Psalm 119, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Settled, it's finished. It is truth. I want you to look with me, if you would, to the book of John, the gospel according to John in chapter 17. In John 17, we find the Lord's Prayer. Not to be mistaken with the model prayer. This is, in fact, the Lord's Prayer. He prays for you and me. Aren't you thankful for that? In the heart of of this, notice, he prays a great many things. Notice, let's, let's read in verse 1. It says, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that the Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, and he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I, ha- uh, which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus, all of these claims to deity. He says in verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto, uh, unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. 
Now, they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I come out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Look in verse 9 of chapter 17. And mark these words. I pray for them. Perhaps there's no more encouraging words in all of God's word than Jesus saying he prays for you and me. He says, I pray for them. This is present perfect. A continuing action. At this very moment, Jesus is praying for you. He says, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. All mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Notice verse 17. Christ prays, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. What is the Lord's intention? That he would keep us from the evil that is in this world. That we would be set apart from that that we would be sanctified from that. Sanctified from the world unto the Lord. How are we sanctified? Well, we're sanctified through the truth of God's word. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Church tonight, as we consider the word of God and how we have received it, we must continue receiving it, not simply as God's word alone, but as it is in truth, the word of God. It's God's word it's true, notice finally tonight as we look back in chapter 2 and verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians, we must receive it as it is able to change your life. Look what the Bible says in verse 13. It says, Ye received the word of God which ye heard of us. Ye received it not as, uh, as, it, uh, as it is in, tr- uh, I'm sorry, yet when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, he received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. It effectually worketh. Effectually worketh. This means that God's word is active. It means that God's word is efficient. It means that it's mighty. Active, efficient, and mighty. God's word can change your life. What's the requirement? Belief. You've got to believe it. Church, consider a couple things concerning God's word tonight. Look back in Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. I want you to consider something tonight about the truth of God's word. In verse 29, the Lord asks a rhetorical question. He makes, he asks the question, he says, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord? What do fires do? Fires consume. Fires produce heat. 
Fire, fires change things, don't they? We were in, in Pigeon Forge in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Was it a couple years ago? We took uh, couples from our church to the uh, Faith for the Family Couples Retreat. A couple years prior to that, there was a massive forest fire that went through Smoky Mountain National Park, consumed much of Gatlinburg. The landscape was altered, wasn't it? I remember years ago, my wife and I, we had just gotten married and we were driving at night uh, through a town called St. George, Utah. It was right outside Zion National Park, which is perhaps one of the most beautiful places in all of our country. And there was forest fires, or wildfires. There's really not a lot of forest in the desert. There was wildfires. And on the top of the ridges, you could see the red outline. You could see the fires at the top of the ridges. It was, it was an eerie feeling. But fires, they change landscapes, don't they? Is not my word like a fire? Look what he says also there in verse 29. He says, uh, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Now, unless you're from West Virginia, they may not teach you this. There's a man by the name of John Henry. Anybody know who John Henry was? What was that? He was a steel driving man. What was, what was he tasked to do? He was built the railroad, didn't he? It's said that John Henry outworked a locomotive. What a man, right? Had a hammer. And drove those spikes. Busted all of those rocks. He was, a, he was a mighty man, wasn't he? Strong man. God's word is like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. You know, sometimes our hearts are like stone, aren't they? Where we've become so deadened and callous to the things of this world, by the things of this world. We're so hard-hearted. And God's word can change our hearts. Just keep, just keep hitting it with the hammer. That's a, that's a great life lesson anyway. Just keep hitting it with a hammer. It'll break. It'll go in. But that's God's word, isn't it? Look in the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, chapter number four. The word of God worketh effectually. God's word changes our lives, does it not? It changes our lives because it changes our hearts. In Hebrews chapter four, in verse 12, we're again given a description of the effectual working of God's word. The Bible says this, notice verse 12, for the word of God is quick. The word quick means more than fast. It means you're alive. It means to be alive. For instance, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. We were dead, but now we're alive because of the effectual working of God. Look what he says. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, swords are sharp, aren't they? Well, God's word is sharper than any sword made by man. He says, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know, I pray that none of us in here tonight are content with where we are in our lives. I pray that tonight as we gather around God's word, we're praying and seeking God's grace and help for victory. I pray tonight that God would help us become tired of our sin and begin seeking his transforming work. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
How can we become transformed by the renewing of our minds? How are our minds renewed? Through the word of God. Church, do you want God to make a difference in your life? Then you've got to receive it for what, God's word for what it is. You know, don't, be, don't speculate on scripture. Don't deny scripture. Don't question scripture. Read it. Surrender your heart to it and allow God to work. Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, man, they were, they were being deceived. They were, they, were, they were discouraged. But Paul reminded them of the truth of God's word. Aren't you thankful that God is faithful? Aren't you thankful his word is true? Aren't you thankful you can rely upon it? Aren't you thankful it has the power of God to change your life? The question is tonight, will you continue to receive it? How do I receive the word of God? Well, you can't receive the word of God when it sits closed on your nightstand. You can't receive God's word unless you open it. You pray and ask God to teach you. You memorize it. You meditate upon it. And you become acquainted with it. I mean, this is a sword. I was at the police department the other day, and one of the sergeants walked in, was sitting in the commander's office, just chatting it up for a few minutes. I hadn't seen him for a while. He's a good friend of mine. He says, Chaplain, I'm in trouble now. Say, have you qualified? No, I haven't qualified yet. Christian, have you qualified? You know what law enforcement officers have to do? They have to qualify to carry in order to carry their service weapon. You and I are soldiers of Christ. We have a service weapon. It's not a 1911. It's a 1611. (laughs) Technically, it's not a 1611, but anyway. But how well can you use it? Can you get on target with it? Are you proficient? Church, You and I need to study to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Church, don't be discouraged tonight. You've got the word of God. Don't give up tonight. You have the word of God. Don't be duped by society tonight. You have the word of God. Don't be content with where you are in your life. You have the word of God. May the Lord help us tonight gain a deeper relationship with this book. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let's stand to our feet.